All right, we're live and on Las Vegas Triathlon Club Facebook page and we're recording and I totally have drawn a blank on an introduction, Ted. Oh my goodness. I know. So here's our, um, we are, as, as some, we've, we've talked about this soft launch already a bit, but we are going to start this evidence-based triathlete. There it is. That's yeah. our new logo. So this yeah. is going to be our podcast. And uh, so this, uh, these video series that we've been doing uh, at one point, I think it was you said, uh, boy, we should do this as a podcast. And I said, yeah, I guess that I, we are doing it. And so, but yeah, let's start making it official. Yeah, we're just, we're creating a ton of content. What do we count last week? 26 or 27 episodes basically yeah. we've done already. That's right. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of good content here and there's, in triathlon, it seems like there will be a never-ending uh, ability to talk about things that yep. are evidence-based triathlon, and and not you know not the rumor mill, and not um, you know who's racing where, when, mm -hmm. pro races, like not you know that's that's not what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about ways to you know become better triathletes, healthier people, uh, mentally healthier people, physically healthier people, and enjoy the sport of triathlon to you know to to its fullest. Yep. No. And then it's tied to our sports research innovation initiative at UNLV. And that's been an impetus to, to get this type of community outreach program going. And the, you know, the mission of that uh, sports research is, you know, optimize health and maximize performance. And so we're going to need to twist that a little bit specifically for our evidence-based triathletes. So but I, John, I, I would say that's what we're doing. That's what exactly. That's right. And we're exactly. trying to, we're trying to blend the anecdotes, the stories with the evidence. And sometimes the anecdotes and the evidence agree and sometimes they disagree. And then it's sort of fun to dive into that to try to figure out uh, why anecdotes exist, but uh, there's no evidence for them. Yeah. And I think tonight's topic is, uh, is a perfect example of that. It is. It is. But before we get to that, what do you got planned coming up this weekend? Well, we get the trick or treat uh, time trial tomorrow uh, with the Las Vegas Triathlon Club. I have not decided if I'm going to do both or just just the the, the Red Rock one. Um, swim swim tomorrow, and then I'm going to do a ride on Sunday that I've kind of always wanted to do. Mm. I'm going to ride. I'm call, I call it the Big Loop. Okay. So from my house in Summerlin, uh, all the way around the Spring Mountains. So into go to Pahrump and then continue on to Indian Springs and all the way around. It's uh, 140 to 150 miles. Nice. And uh, yeah, I've been, I figure like I'm in the shape to do it now. Yeah. And I got to take advantage of that. And it's supposed to be beautiful weather. So I'm, 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 uh, I'm going to do it. And I, John, you're more than welcome to join me if you'd like for, for some of it or all of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's going to be you know it's gonna be like seven eight hours of riding but uh i'm really looking forward to it how about you what do you got going on this weekend well i i, I would love to do that but i've already I'm, I'm into a little bit of off season mode and i've got a project this weekend that i've already started this week i uh as you know i went out to arizona last weekend and picked up an old trailer I know it's so exciting. Yeah, I was excited too up until I started working on it. Then I'm like, oh, <laughs> I may be in over my head here. <laughs> well, you know, the nice thing is nowadays there's YouTube videos and podcasts and yeah. on you can learn anything and you can yeah. do anything. You know, uh, I often tell that to my students. I'm like, you literally can learn anything. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's an exciting. It's honestly, it's an exciting time to be alive because of that. Yep. You know, John, if you'd have bought this trailer uh, 25 years ago and maybe had an old manual or something, mm -hmm. you know, you, you may have been in over your head. I don't think you're in over your head because you, you have that ability to learn that. Well, but I sometimes don't have the patience. And so, but now <laughs> yeah, like, but then there's YouTube videos on how to, how to be patient as well. <laughs> I, I'm just ready to go. I, I want to, but here's, you know, what you're right. You know, 25 years, I mean, this trailer's you know, over 50 years old, 61. Right. So it's, and so it's older than me. Um, <laughs> but um, I can see as I started doing some demo work to get ready to do some repairs, someone else did try to do some renovation and they didn't do it the way that the videos now are telling you to do it. And so now 
I've got to undo what someone did <laughs> and then try to redo, uh, do, do redo things the correct way. So it's going to be a little bit of double work there, but, but so it's fun. I like the challenges. You, what, what, did, what, what did you start on, start on this week with it? All right. Well, I'll use a little vintage trailer talk here. Uh, I am removing the skin. So I am taking the outer part off. Now, what I also did is I took a tile sample and I sent it off for asbestos testing. Because back in that era, uh, there were tiles that, that uh, they used asbestos for. So I'm, uh, you know, I want to be safe. Yeah, of course. Yeah, the last call. thing you want to be doing is going, uh, you know, <laughs> trying to trying to go out and have a good time in your in your trailer and and uh, you know make the most of it and then basically be killing yourself. That's right. All right. That's All right. So that that's this weekend. Yep. Uh, so I said I'm I'm heading to off season. You're not quite at off season. No, I'm a uh, oh, man. I am. Uh, what's it? What's how do I put it? I'm going into the off season, but I'm. I don't like to just stop. I like to it's kind of tapered down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for example, like for me this this year, you know, I'm, I'm I've kind of committed that I'm gonna take two days off uh, a week. In, in the on season, I you only gonna take one day off a week. So my off season is going to be taking two days off a week. Um, so that's kind of where I'm going, but I'm want to, I, I want to take advantage of my fitness that I have right now and do some epic things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I did one epic thing. And it's like, well, you know what, that was great, but now let's still like hang on and take, take, take advantage of it and enjoy, uh, enjoy that fitness rather than just, you know, stop it. And then, you know, take a month off and then, Oh man, I, I got to start all over again. So mm -hmm. my plan is to kind of you know taper, uh, taper off into into November, mid December, and then start to start to build up again. But yep. I'm a I'm a slow I'm a slow taper, and I, and partly of it is I never felt like I was, you know I, I my build for the Everest thing and was never I never took any big jumps, mm -hmm. right? So I never really. I didn't really deal much with injury this year. Mm -hmm. And um, so I never really felt like, oh man, I just need to, I need some time off. I just yep. didn't, didn't feel like that. Whereas, you know, when you finish your race, maybe, or your season with a couple of races, mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit, I think it's a little bit different. So. No, you're right. And, and this year is so unique because our off season, well, I guess our off season has been really, <laughs> we haven't really had a season. Uh, we've we've had to train as if we had a season, but uh, but we really have had an extended off season. I guess my off season off season technically started after you know the epic challenge I did, but really once St. George was was canceled, that was the last race that really I had in play at that point. And so, um, but you know, in a normal year, I would wait uh, well after Pumpkin Man and even make it into probably December before doing an off season. Yeah, because you might race mid mid to late November historically. That's right. Maybe That's even right. Into, into December and then hit your off season, right? That's right. And so and that's typical for me is mid November is the last race of the year I usually do. Mm -hmm. And um and then you know then kind of hit the reset button. Yeah. And then the other thing, John, I think we're both probably going through this as well is we don't know if we're going to race in the spring. No, right? not yeah. And so this is a weird off season because, you know, oftentimes, and I know you're in the same case, you know, March, end of March, beginning of April, mm -hmm. Oceanside, yep. 70.3 um, is kind of like, it's a big hit. Mm -hmm. And it takes, you know, if you want to do well there, it takes two or three months of build. That's right. Good. To, to do that. But I'm not counting on racing in April. Mm -hmm. I'm not, my the first race on my actual radar that I might do is St. George in May. Okay. But the only the first one I'm I'm signed up for is um, the ITU Worlds in August. Mm, okay. You I'm signed up for Oceanside. So I am I'm going to train as if it's going to happen until we know more. And I think I've got a little better mindset for how to yeah. do that this year versus last year. I have a little bit more of a strategy. Yeah. Or really you know, that doesn't really yeah. kick in until the real training doesn't kick in until January. Yeah. And so now it's just the end of October. Uh, so now when I hit an off season, uh, what I typically do is I still, I still train six days a week, uh, but I just really back off my volume. 
for an, a, a period of time, really to get sort of recovered. And, uh, and I'll drop, you know, like even like right now, I'll just run two miles. Yep. Uh, I'll, I'm biking on my mountain bike at this point. Uh, I bike to the pool, you know, an extended route. I'll swim a thousand meters, you know, and I just try to hold that, that consistent training and really hold that time in my schedule uh, that I know that I like to train. And so it's still part of my, my daily routine. I don't like stopping exercise, just like you. I just don't, because I enjoy it too much. I enjoy being out. And uh, yeah, uh, but I do try to recognize that there's a period of time in our training program throughout the year that it's probably good to back off and, and really make sure we gain a little bit of weight <laughs> and really recover. Yeah. So I guess at, at this point, we should probably say what we're going to talk about tonight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. It seems we totally blew the introduction yeah. already. So, to, so tonight's topic is planning for the off season and ideas for, for the off season mm -hmm. and using the off season. In my mind, it's using the off season to become better for next season. Yep. And, you know, what can we do to recover mm -hmm. in a way that is still going to, at the end of the day, you know, make us better for next year, or at least not worse. Right. We're both getting, we're both getting older and uh, mm -hmm. I'm kind of looking at it now, as long as I don't slow down, it's a, it's a win. Yeah. Right. And, um, but that's becoming increasingly difficult year by year. Uh, I don't normally, I don't, I don't look at it anymore as like, oh man, I'm going to set a new PR next year. I'm looking at it. Well, if I can just hold to where I was, so that was, a, that's oh. a big win for me. <laughs> so, and it, and, and honestly, I think a lot of people and you, you've already kind of went down that road, not a lot of people, but some people, they literally just turn it off and mm -hmm. it's like six weeks, eight weeks of nothing. And that's okay. That's, mm -hmm. that's one way. That's one approach to do it. No. I, I personally don't like that approach uh, because, you know, I feel like I've done all of this work, you know, through the last, you know, 10, 12 years uh, to build me to a certain point that I don't want to digress mm -hmm. that much. I'll, 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 I'll go, I'll get less fit in the next, you know, two months. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, if I look at my, my training peaks, you know, I'll go down 30%, but I don't want to go down 80%. Right. And I think, you know, I, I think that that is, uh, that's important to, to, to do that. But also, like you said, it's important to, to do some, maybe some different things and have some fun, right? Like you mentioned mm -hmm. that you're riding your mountain bike. That's not something you normally spend a lot of time doing. No. And, and so with the tri club, uh, we posted multi-sport November. Yeah. So recognizing uh, most people are not racing. I know there's a few that are still training for Ironman Arizona, Ironman Florida, and even uh, 70.3 uh, Gulf Coast. So yep. uh, there's still some people that have a race in play and, and they're still training, but the vast majority of us are, are, are in our off season, if you will, if you want to call it that. And so, yeah, we started uh, multi-sport uh, November to see how many different sports you can do. Yep. Yeah, Which and, is a and good I'm way to I think it's exciting. I think it's good. I think, you know, because people, I mean, like you said, you get to, you get to scratch that itch. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And, and for, for me, one of the things that I love is like, you know, and, and once again, we're going to have someone talk about this, but circadian rhythm stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I want to be outside when in the morning mm -hmm. and, you know, see the blue sky. And, you know, we were so fortunate. We live in this, this city or this area where we get blue sky almost every day. Yeah. Right. And see this, you know, and, and get up and see the sunrise and you know, awake you and wait and awaken your soul almost. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't mind doing it walking, you know, mm -hmm. this week, uh, you know, two or three mornings, it was a walk instead of, a, you know, a run. Well, and we can add walking good. in as a multi-sport. Exactly. Yeah. There's, there's nothing wrong with, uh, with, nope. with a walk. And actually, as we look at, um, you know, some of the, the highest level coaches, um, in Ironman in particular, they're prescribing a lot of walking these days. Mm -hmm. if you've been following that. Um, but, you know, especially on the long run day is, is like, you know, get to 10 miles and then every other mile, walk a mile. Mm -hmm. yeah. And just, you know, it's, it's still aerobic. It's still time on your feet yeah. and it's not beating you up as much. You know, um, you know, I got my step counter just like everybody else on our, our, our watches. Mm -hmm. And I'm still trying to get, you know, the 12,500 steps a day. Yeah. And it's just maybe it's just different now. And, yep. and, and, and I think that's a good, 
I think that's a good thing. Well, let, let's talk a little bit about the science behind yes. off season. And, you know, there's, there's this phrase that, that we all use periodization, uh, which is really just a way to describe how your training program is going to fluctuate throughout a period, whether it be a year, maybe three months or whatever it is, maybe five years, depending on, on your goal, but it just describes a way to fluctuate your training stress, which is a function of your volume, intensity, and frequency and time that you're doing and which sport you're doing as well. Uh, but uh, I don't know, how do you, maybe we can even boil this down to, uh, you know, how do you fit your off season into even a week? You know, yeah. how do you, how do you, because really off season is just recovery. I mean, yeah. it's just a different word for recovery in the way that we're looking yeah. at this. Well, and I, and I think, John, I think, you know, we're going to have, a, we're going to have several episodes coming up on recovery in, in mm -hmm. particular. But I think that it's important to understand that recovery does not necessarily have to mean regression, right? Right. Recovery is the time when you build. Mm -hmm. like resting, when you're training, resting is building. If we just train, 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 we'll never build. And so this is actually giving our body a chance to reset, to have, you know, we don't want to get too technical, but have uh, collagen fibers be laid down, have elastin fibers be, be, be laid down, have muscle, have the ability not to constantly be under stress. And, you know, then there's the one big underlying thing that people don't like to talk about, and we should talk about it, is the, the endocrine system. So the hormonal system in your body. You know, we put our bodies under a tremendous amount of stress and, um, you know, we can, we'll, we can talk more about this in another episode, but the, the, you know, always being under stress will have cortisol levels be increased. And when you look at triathletes and there's evidence here, it's good, good stuff out of Australian Institute of Sport about the high levels of, of cortisol. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you have high levels of cortisol, that usually reflects we have high levels of inflammation and then high levels of inflammation will, will usually mean put pressure on the thyroid and then people become hypothyroid. And then we look at the, um, the other uh, adrenal and sex hormones, then those get influenced where in men in particular, we'll have lower levels of testosterone uh, due to you know, constant, basically constant high levels of stress. So all of these systems, all of these systems need recovery. And, you know, it's, uh, it's something that oftentimes is neglected because we, you know, in our minds and in, you know, the, the high level athletes mind, it's man, if I'm not training, I'm doing something wrong. And really if it's more of, if I'm not recovering, I'm doing something wrong. So we can have weeks, months of recovery, days of recovery. And it really is, it should be planned out. I, that's at least my opinion. It should be planned. And if you look at, um, you know, basic, you know, exercise physiology textbooks, you know, we break this down into macro cycles, micro cycles, and meso cycles, as far as you know, how much time we're, we're actually talking about. But in general, I think that, you know, the successful person will look at it, you know, in the sense of, of a year, in a month, and in weeks. Mm -hmm. And so you asked me, I know I've kind of went off on this long tangent, but you asked me about a week. And so for me in this off season, I'm, I'm going to do my very best to take two days off a week. And during, during the season, I take one day off a week. And so already I'm doubling my days of recovery. Mm -hmm. Now I, and we've talked about this in pa pa past podcasts. I'm a strong believer in pol polarized training. I'm going to continue polarized training. I will just do a little bit less, right? So and so less zone, less of my zone two and less of my zone five and or six or whatever, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm personally, I'm still going to do one really hard workout a week. Yeah. You know, it work. Cause I, I really think that it's important to get the engine revved up at least once a week, hit maximum heart rates, uh, or if that's the week I'm going to do that, or uh, do like a lactic threshold, uh, extend a lactic threshold or, um, an, even a VO2 max session a week, one time a week, I'm going to do that. Mm -hmm. And then the rest is going to, for me, is zone two and below. For, for me, I'm looking at heart rates in the 120s. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not going above 120. 
or sorry, 130. So in the in the 120s. And that takes discipline, mm -hmm. right? Because you, we've talked about this before as well as, you know, you're out there on your bike and your friends come by you and they're, hey, come on, keep up with us. Let's go. And the discipline has to be, you know, I'm good. Mm -hmm. you, guys, you guys go ahead. I'm, I'm sticking to my plan and I'm, you know, I'm building aerobic capacity or I'm not losing aerobic capacity. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's how I'm handling, um, well, let's put it this way, the next five or six weeks, maybe seven mm -hmm. weeks. Um, I always do a, a little training camp around Christmas time. Right? Yeah. Zip down to California for a week and, uh, and do a, a, a training camp. And then I have another recovery, recovery after that. So I kind of build in one or two hard weeks, even in the, in like maybe like the next two months. Mm -hmm. but it, instead of in my normal, like in season, I'll do three weeks hard and one week off. Now I'm going to do three weeks easier, one week hard. Okay. That's, you know, that's, that's how I envision well, uh, let's, the next let's, couple months going. Let's take that yep. perspective and let me share part of a presentation I did for a lecture uh, this week in my class for physiology of endurance performance. And I talked about uh, general adaptation syndrome because what you're talking about is this, what we're talking about, this periodization is really goes back to Hans Salie in the work that he did. Now, he never envisioned his work would be used by uh, athletes in, in any sport. So he did not, he was not a sports scientist. He was interested in just how a stress may influence an organism. And uh, his model is uh, described by uh, these three phases that are in this slide. And what his model um, illustrates is when an organism is stressed, where this red arrow is here, there's an alarm response. And that alarm response is in essence like a fight or flight uh, type syndrome where it, it makes something happen. And uh, this is resistance to stress. And initially your resistance to the stress is bad. Yeah, it's gonna be a negative for sure. That's right, it's gonna be bad. But then eventually you get into an adaptation stage <coughs> or phase and it's, um, it builds up resistance or the, the organism learns how to manage the stress that it was just imposed, that was imposed on it. And now this is, I should say, this is time on the x-axis here. And this time unit right now is undefined. Right. This, this could be a single workout or it could be a year. All right, so, it, it, but this is the idea behind uh, periodization is then we, we have a stress we have a period of adaptation, but this is the, where that recovery becomes important. And if we continue to apply that, imply that, uh, apply that stress, eventually the body or the organism becomes exhausted and we end up with an injury. And so one of the, the challenges of having repeated stress imposed on someone is reaching this phase right here, which we call overtraining or maybe it is an overuse injury that happens. Yep. It was just my next slide. It, 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 you're, you're talking about cortisols, cortisol and what have you. So here's just, if you apply a stress here and you have an appropriate response and you have some adaptation and your resistance to the stress is better, it's improved. Well, if you apply another stress here, you're gonna, I, I should have done this graphic a little different. You're gonna impose a new uh, alarm to the system and you may impose that stress too soon and that's going to push you into the injury region where you're not allowing enough time enough ability to recover and build up that resistance to stress now what's resistance to stress you mentioned cortisol but it's even something as simple as well you build up more mitochondria you build up a better blood flow. You build up a better way to extract oxygen from the blood. Those are all resistance to the stress uh, in terms of the stress being uh, an exercise session. You're trying to trying to get those adaptations so that you are 
uh, better able to respond to that stress of, of exercise. And in essence, you run faster, you bike faster or swim faster. It's, you know, John, do you know the concept of hormesis? No. So hormesis or hormetic response basically is, is it's the organism's response to stress is that it's going to basically upregulate things to mm. basically find homeostasis, right? So this is what exercise is, is it's this, it's a, called a hormetic response. We have this response to the, the one that I always hear about is um, into the antioxidants. Mm. So we would agree that like blueberries are, you know, they have a lot of antioxidants, right? Well, the blueberry, the antioxidant in blueberry is actually a little bit of a poison to us. But what it does is it makes our body respond and upregulate its own antioxidant system. Mm -hmm. That's that response. And same to the response to exercise, right? Our exercise is actually doing damage to our body. I think we would all agree that on a on certain level, exercise does damage. And then the response to that damage is this, you know, the inflammatory phase and the remodeling phase and the maturation phase and, and all these phases of response. And this is exactly what you're basically exactly what you're saying is our body is literally just trying to find homeostasis and balance mm -hmm. with what we're imposing upon it. But we have to give it time to do it. And that's what, like, I love that fact that you had time along the, the, um, the axis there along your X axis there, because it is all about time. Yeah. Right? And it's resistance, it's resistance over time and load over time that uh, we need to, to manage to, to not get injured and to not have burnout and to not have overtraining syndrome. And, and that is the, that is truly, that's the key to becoming a better athlete. You know, I, I have obviously people and students ask me all the time, you know, like what's the, you know, what's the secret? And the secret is the balance, mm -hmm. right? And, and it's not just a physical thing. It's a mental thing as well, right? I mean, John, how many, how many people have you came in, came in contact with in your years of triathlon that were all gung ho and I'm all in and, and then two years down the road, they're gone. You never see them again. Yeah. Just a few. <laughs> there's a lot right? it, it, there is a lot and and you're right and it and, it, and then i think it, it's partly because they may not be seeing the results that they are expecting and i think that's a big issue is is having realistic goals and yeah. uh, i think the other part is uh, you can see some big gains in performance initially but then the gains after that take a little bit more to sort of work through and, uh, and, and, and you really have to plan them out. And then now you're only getting little gains, but you're putting in a lot more time. Yeah, you're, you're, you're putting in a, a tremendous amount more effort and you're, and you're getting your 1% gain here and your 1% gain there. Mm -hmm. and, you, and I'll attribute it to, you know, to our physiologic system because we, we have limits. There are limits. To mm -hmm. what we do. Um, you know, we, we already were talking about, we're getting older. Um, that's part of it. And then I also think that, People make errors, like training and recovery errors, and um, you know we we weren't really planning on going down this road, but I'll go. I, I want to go down this road a little bit. I think oftentimes people also they they hire coaches who are overzealous, and those coaches. I mean, I, nothing against coaches. I, I I there's some great coaches even in Las Vegas. There's great coaches everywhere, but coaches need to have results. Right. If if, you know, let's say we're the Las Vegas Raiders. Right. And if they only win two games for a couple of seasons, their coaches can't fired. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's the same with the triathlon coach. If I hire a triathlon coach and I my goal is, hey, coach, you know, we're going to meet. And we're going to sit down and say, you know, I want to get 10 percent better this year. And if the coach says, yep, we can do that. And I do everything that coach says and I get worse. Guess what I'm going to do? Mm hmm. I'm going to fire that coach yeah. and I'm going to go find the next one. And right. so oftentimes there, are, you know, I think people take the, the short route and I think it's because of their own ego. And I think it's oftentimes because of, of the pressure to, to on coaches to get these results that are often short term where they're not allowing for proper recovery, but you can do it for a short amount of time. You can get 10% gain in a year 
and completely burn out and get injured and but still get that one good result well and, 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 and i think it's an important concept and i and i think i think you're spot on that being said i think that it's really important for athletes to interview their coaches and for coaches to interview their athletes because yep. there are uh, coaches that you know cater more towards the non uh, ultra competitive athlete or that's not the bulk of the uh, coaching that they do and yep. what they are more involved with is uh, building a community of athletes and and that's not really a result driven coach uh, and so i think that's the balance that someone needs to yeah, but then again, so then you get the ultra competitive person that gets in that group yeah. and, they're, and they're not going to get the results they want there either. You're, you're sure exactly right. There needs to be, and you, when people select a coach, you're, you're absolutely right. There needs to be an interview and it needs to go both ways. And, the, and, 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 and I find that oftentimes athletes are willing to interview the coach mm -hmm. and say, you know, what, this is not right for me. But for, anecdotally, I, I don't see too many coaches turning away athletes, mm -hmm. right? Because I, and I get it, like this is their, how they're helping to, them to make a living. Mm -hmm. And um, that can be, it can be a very difficult thing to do. Now, uh, I'll say the value of a coach is illustrated by this slide right here. <laughs> this slide. Um, You're going to uh, describe our slides, John, because we're going podcast, remember? Oh, that's right. Okay. Thank you. That's right. We'll just be audio. Okay. So on this slide, uh, I've actually pulled it from uh, Tim Noakes' book, The Law of Running, which I use for my textbook for my class, Physiology of Endurance Performance. And what this slide illustrates is a training program overview. So on the x-axis is weeks of training, on the y-axis is race performance. And uh, you can, if you could see the, 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 uh, the slide, uh, which, which those watching the video can, you'll see it's a very complicated slide in terms of lines going in different directions based upon uh, race uh, that you're categorizing or type of athlete and so forth. And so it's complicated. And that's where a coach does come in. It becomes very valuable because they can spend the time dealing with the details of the program, whereas the athlete can say, oh, this is what I need to do. Uh, and so but, you know, even here on my slide, I say, you know, the, the type of program that's built out here has to match the goals of the person. And if the goal of the person is just to lose weight or to complete an event versus compete an event, then the complexity of the program doesn't need to be that, that deep. And maybe the program consists of, well, for the next 100 days, run once a day for 20 minutes each. You know, it can be very, very straightforward. And, but that's the, that's the trick with matching uh, with, with the coach. Now, okay, so this is the evidence-based triathlete. Yep. So I've got this slide here illustrating this complex program. You know how much research is out there actually testing the effectiveness of a program like this? Very, very little. It's really tough research to do. Yeah. And I think this is something that uh, I... I think it's important for people to know is that even the periodization as applied to endurance performance is really a tough model to experimentally uh, uh, tease out. And even what we you know, started focusing on the off season, you know, making sure that the off season does, uh, does matter empirically is actually tough. Now, the research that is out there is usually built around a 15 week periodization model. And I always like to talk with my students about that. And I say, why 15 weeks? How did that come out? Oh, well, you know, maybe there's something. I'm going to guess why. Here, go for it. Is that how long a semester? Of That's how long. Exactly. <laughs> because, you know, a lot of the research is done at a university and you've got people who sign up for some type of class or running class or strength training, whatever it is. And, it, it you know, the semester is 15 weeks long. And so you do a pre-test, you do some type of program where you divide people into different types of programs, you do a post test and that's a perfect experimental model to use. Yeah. Uh, now, some, some universities are trimesters and they're only 10 weeks. And so then you see some 10 week training programs that are tested out. So, you know, <clears throat> it is important to know and limitation of the research is a lot of the training program type research is, um, is built upon uh, the college student 
as a subject, maybe not even a competitive uh, athlete. And it's built around a time period that's really dictated more by logistics of a semester uh, as opposed to, hey, let's, let's test out the effectiveness of a 52 week program. And Ted, I'm gonna randomize you to one group yep. and I'll be in another group. I don't know, would you even do that type of experiment? Nope. No, that's right. Because you don't know if that, whatever you get put in, if that's even gonna be effective. Exactly. So it's really challenging to actually tease this out, but this is where uh, some of the anecdotes of following athletes or, you know, retrospectively looking back at training logs uh, where you do try to develop this understanding of what works and what doesn't work for periodization. You know, I, I, I think you're right on. And, and the other thing I'm going to add is that, you know, what kind of sample do we see in, in most of these uh, um, research papers, John? Uh, sample size, well, again- it's, Not sample size, uh, oh. sample characteristics as far as age, sex. Oh, it's usually men, college age, uh, in terms of enduring, especially in training programs. And it's men because uh, you know, if you have female subjects, you do need to account for and understand the hormonal changes. And unfortunately, uh, too many researchers are, are just lazy in that. And the, it's easier to say, well, let's just use men as, uh, as subjects. And young men. Young men, that's right, college age. So, you know, and I think that's really important because if we, if we think about the, you know, our audience, is, it's probably going to run the gamut from uh, you know, college age people up until people in their 70s or maybe even the 80, their 80s. And there is just, there's no research on people or that I could find today and yesterday looking into this um, for people, you know, past 45. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's just, there, there just is very, very little. And, um, and I think that that's important to, to think about. And then when we think about that, we really do need to think about like, um, the call, it's called the pillars of, you know, of evidence-based medicine mm -hmm. and evidence-based practice. And we've talked a little bit about this before. Yeah, go through that again, though. That's really okay. important. Okay. So I'm actually going to... Oh, let me make sure you can share. Share. Okay. Well, actually, I'm not quite ready yet. I got to find that. I, I wasn't prepared to go down this road, but we can really, let's just, we'll just talk about it. So there really are three pillars of, of evidence-based medicine, and we can look at evidence-based medicine, very similar to evidence-based training. And, you know, number one pillar out of the three, and you can't have one without the others. So the number one pillar is um, the evidence that we see in research, but that's only one piece, right? Then the other, the, the next piece is the, um, the clinician. So let's think of that as the coach. Right, so the coach's expertise. So now, if we, if we just have those two pieces, we have a balance, right? And there's the art of coaching and there's the science of research. And they're very, very important. But the third one is the patient, or in this case, the athlete. And it's the, and it's the athlete's beliefs that are really, really important. So all three of these things have to be balanced and that that's the most difficult thing to, to do is to, to, to grab all of these pieces and put it all together into an individual person and come up with a, a, a training plan, right? Because if we have the evidence that says one thing and the coach says one thing, but the athlete doesn't believe in it, it's not going to work, mm -hmm. right? We have the evidence say something, the athlete say, you know, believe it, and the coach doesn't follow through with that, it's not gonna work. It never, it, it won't work unless we have all three pillars. And I think that when we get into, when we really get into this, because in this situation, there's not a lot of good research. So now what the next best thing we can do is those other two pillars, right? Is look at the coach's experience and the athlete's expectations or the athlete's beliefs. And so now the, our pillar is gonna be a little bit slanted to one side but that's, that's the best we can do. And sometimes in, in medicine and in training as well, that's the best we can do because the evidence doesn't exist or we're extrapolating evidence from eight week studies or 15 week studies with college ma age men. That, and that's in the best case scenario, right? Yeah. A lot of the research we read and we come up with is 
in endurance, there's some there's some good work on dogs. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's lots of good work on mice, but you know that uh, how relevant are these uh, are these things to what we're trying to do? Because mice doing triathlon triathlon this doesn't really exist, you know. So um, I think that that's that 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 is important when we when we really get into to to, to areas like this where. <sighs> The, the evidence isn't the greatest. So when, you know, when, when I was looking and I know you were looking this week at this stuff and trying to, to kind of get some evidence here, I think the best evidence we have right now is probably people, their, their experiences and the coaches with their experiences, mm -hmm. you know, and there's a lot of good books, right? Uh, there's a lot of good books out there, but then you, then you, the skeptic has to look at it and say, well, the book needs to do something different and be somewhat uh, controversial maybe to actually sell books, right? Cause I, I can't just produce a book that, you know, two other people produce and say the same thing. I've got to, I've got to say something else. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got to say something that's a little bit different. And we, we see this, we see this all of the time in, in, uh, in, in, in let's, let's look at the diet industry, right? Um, we can even go down the low carb, high fat, which is, was three or four years ago. You couldn't, in, in the endurance world, you couldn't uh, find a, a new book or a, a podcast or a YouTube video that wasn't really kind of talking about that. We're supposed to be talking about diet for endurance athletes, right? And it was controversial. And so books were being produced and uh, oh, everyone's like, oh, do you see this new book? Do you see this new book? This is different. This is new. And these things constantly are evolving and constantly changing. And so, you know, we, we come up with these, you know, sexy ideas that maybe are not rooted, um, you know, always with the, you know, with, with good evidence and even good, and maybe not even good experience sometimes. It's just, and I, and I hate to be the skeptic, but sometimes it's just to sell books. No, it, it is good to be skeptical or critical uh, in fact, uh, even in, in looking at periodization, there's a paper I did come across uh, today. It, it's titled Periodization Theory, Confronting yeah. an Inconvenient Truth. And that's by John Kiley in 2018. And th that's exactly what uh, he's reviewing here is where is the science behind it? And is this really the best way to train? And so it is, you know, but that's the scientific method is we, you know, we should have this iteration of ideas that are generated and then tested through empirical evidence and then reevaluated, but then test again. Uh, and, you, you know, it's just, you know, cyclical process uh, of, uh, of, of continuing to evaluate ideas. And so it's good to be critical, not to be critical, but to be critical. I think it's good to be skeptical. Right? Yeah. You know, we... Well, you want to be skeptical, but it doesn't mean you can't try things. And, you know, what's the worst thing that can happen? Well, you get injured, mm -hmm. right? Um, the risk, the risk is not that great, honestly. Uh, or you don't perform as well as you wanted to your first, you know, couple races of the year. You, you know, the, the race, the, 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 the risk is not that big. So then, you know, you go down this whole road and then as you read, then did this come up for you? And this is something that I've known about for a while is reverse periodization. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, reverse periodization. Well, that seems to me to be the exact opposite of periodization, <laughs> but it's not, it's not what it's meaning. Reverse periodization means to go harder in your off season. Instead of do base work, you do speed work in the off season. And um, there's, there's some good empirical evidence that that can work too. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then we have not even touched on strength training in the off season. No. And, you know, you know, is that the time to do it or is the time to do strength training during the season or is strength training that important uh, of a metric, depending on who you are, right? Like if we're taking that athlete that wants to just, you know, complete one or two races a year and they're doing it just in for general fitness, do they need to weight train? Maybe, maybe not if you want to finish in the top one or 2% of your age group at Kona might, might be a good thing to, to, to at least go down that road and mm -hmm. see if it, you know, see if it empirically works for you. Um, because that's another area that we can talk about is there is very little research on strength training in triathlon. Mm -hmm. 
you know, there's good research on strength training and running, good research on strength training and cycling, good research on strength training and, and swimming, but I, I cannot find r really good research articles. And if anyone out there has any, please send it to us uh, on strength training in, um, in triathlon. Or athlete specific, yeah. Triathlete specific, but there's a million books. Well, maybe not really. Nice. There's lots of books on strength training for triathletes. And, and it's almost, you know, if you're not doing it, you're not doing it right. And so it is, uh, it is interesting how the anecdotes are, are you know, sort of leading uh, the science here. Uh, but, it, you know, the whole idea of, um, of what you're talking about as well sort of encapsulates in this idea of trying to find the minimum amount of training to get the maximum benefit. Minimum effective dosage. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to tell you a little anecdote, John, okay. uh, because it's a funny one. Uh, so I used to manage a physical therapy clinic. Well, this was eons ago. I can remember we were interviewing people, uh, physical therapists for, for a job. And I loved this guy that came in and we were interviewing him. And uh, I'm like, so basically, you know, what are you really looking for in a, in a job? And he said, you know what? I'm going to lie to you. I wanted the least amount of work and make the most amount of money. Mm. And I said to him, yeah. wow, that is the most honest answer anyone's ever given me. Cause we all believe that Yeah, right. we don't ever say that in an interview, mm -hmm. but you get like 10 bonus points for being completely honest. Yep. Right. And it's, it's the same with triathlon. I wanted the least amount of work to go the absolute fast as I can go. Yep. Right. We talked about that on the podcast a few weeks ago, like for running, I, I, I like running, but I want to run the least amount possible to get the result that I want. Especially in the off season, especially. See, and that's, that's how I approach off season is I'm trying to do the least amount to maintain fitness. Yeah. Not necessarily improve, but I'm trying to do the least amount just to make sure I've got the right amount of fitness so that when I'm ready to take off for a, a training program, uh, I'll be able to, uh, to be successful that way. Wait till you see my Strava this week when I'm on my rollerblades. You're doing rollerblading? Oh, you better walk. I got the cross country ski poles even, and I, I bought the special. There's tips that you put on that will make yeah. you dig into the into the uh, into the uh, tarmac. Well, you better take a picture and add that to our November multi sport. Oh, you know it's going in there, and it'll be on my <laughs> it'll be on my Strava under rollerblading, and I'll be like 20k on uh, of rollerblades. <laughs> um, I found that actually it works really, really well because it is a great job of strengthening your glutes because it's hip extension and external rotation. Yeah. yeah. Um, and you, you look at like hockey players, I mean, they got super strong glutes and. And know, it's pull. getting you out of just moving in that sagittal plane. That and I, and because I got the poles, I'm actually using my arms too. Yeah. I'm going to extension, just like swimming. Yeah. It's a, I actually, in the off season, I, I actually really enjoy doing that. Okay. The, the situation is, is that uh, I don't like going downhill because I don't get any workout. Yeah. It's, it's not like running where you actually work hard on the downhill and even cycling, you can work hard on the downhill. Yeah. Not on rollerblades. You're just trying not to, you know, you're just trying not to crash. Yeah. Oh, so, fine. Yeah. All right. So one of the things that we're talking about also with, um, you know, sort of managing an off season is preventing overtraining. Yeah. So overtraining is one of those syndromes that's hard to define, but terrible if you get it. Uh, and it, it's not always easy to know what to measure uh, to see if you are doing overtraining or you are, are hitting overtraining. There's another term that um, we use in, in class is overreaching, yep. where you wanna stress the system. That's the whole idea. And you do get worse initially but if you allow that recovery, then you'll get better. Uh, and so that overreaching is good because you do need to do more than what you're, you're normally exposed to. But that trick is not constantly doing overreaching to end up overtrained. So John, what are, what are some simple metrics that you know of uh, to measure? Well, let's see. Overreaching or overtraining. I heard... Um, I heard a funny one uh, where they said, if you've met three people in the day and they were all real jerks, you're overtrained <laughs> <laughs> because it's probably you. <laughs> yep. I like that one. Yeah. How about physiologic markers? 
Uh, well, that's the, that's the thing is that they're not, it's not, so here I've got a side up. It's difficult to quantify overtraining yeah. because overreaching and overtraining your markers can be the same. And so you want to have some overreaching. You want to have some disruption of the system, but overtraining really is, is, uh, is difficult. Um, overtraining is accumulation of training and or non-training stress results in a long-term decrement of performance capacity with or without related physiological and psychological signs and symptoms. All right. That's just out of a textbook. And I mean, that, that's serious. Overtraining is, is a, a real syndrome and it takes a long time to recover from being overtrained. If you take a day off or two days off and you, you feel better, you, you probably just overreached temporarily and you haven't re you haven't hit that overtrain overtraining can take uh, months uh, to get uh, to recover you know, John, here, I want to add something into the overtraining yeah yeah just really quickly because one of the one of the things that you know and, and we can talk to Nicole Kylie when, when we get her on next time with with this but one of the things that I've been reading and coming across in the literature is talking about how overtraining and underfueling go together mm-hmm and then the, one of the, and you have your next slide here is how to prevent overtraining. Um, one of the things that I'm coming across is that overtraining can oftentimes be uh, prevented if we are not underfueling. And we, uh, as triathletes, are almost always underfueling and don't recognize it. And that's one that I wanted to throw that in there um, because I think, it's, I think it's, it's critical for our audience. No, I think you and I both really are uh, um, sensitive to the holistic approach to training and it, and you got to have all aspects. I mean, the nutrition, the sleep, uh, all of that uh, is so important to be able to get a training response because, you know, the Hans Salia model, the stress can be anything. It can oh, yeah. be, you know, work stress, family stress, you know, not only exercise stress, it can be stress because you eat the wrong thing. Oh, yeah, how the sure. system is a stressed. So, so here's some. Oh, sorry. I was gonna say, you, you know, we we were talking offline before we started. I had a really stressful meeting yesterday. Yeah. And um, I didn't sleep well last night. Mm -hmm. And my plan was was to get up this morning and go for a run, but I didn't. I I actually waited till like one, two o'clock, you yeah. know, to actually go for. And I went easier than I planned on going, because then the stress yesterday was the stress of that meeting. And I felt physically more depleted than, than I normally would be. And I know it was that very stressful meeting and it had nothing to do with training. Mm -hmm. But once again, you know, I, I had uh, this, this response. I'm sure my, my cortisol was elevated. My Paris, my sympathetic nervous system was, was amped up at a point where it normally wouldn't be. And I, I think you, you hit it right on the head. It, it's, it doesn't have to just be physical. Right. No, it can, it can come in all different directions and sometimes self-imposed. <laughs> so, so let's talk really briefly about some other physiologic me measures that people could potentially use to, to, you know, maybe to recognize when they are recovering mm -hmm. and or not recovering. So you mentioned sleep. Um, sleep is really good to, to look at in particular, if you have difficulty sleeping. Right. So that's actually an early sign of overtraining is if you're waking up in the middle of the night and you can't get back to sleep, mm -hmm. because that usually means that your cortisol is too high um, and your or your awakening response is happening at the wrong time. So that's that's one uh, looking at elevated heart rate and uh, elevated resting heart rate. Yep. So we all know that as we become more fit, that your resting heart rate goes down. But there will be a point when you when you're getting to overtraining that your resting heart rate will, will go up. Now, here's the other little tricky thing. When you're recovering, especially if you do a longer recovery period, your resting heart rate will also go up. But you'll know that because you've been really like, basically you're, you're losing your fitness, which is a different, a different sign. Um, the other one that we will, we'll have a whole podcast on this one, I promise you, is on uh, HRV. Yep. So heart rate variability. Uh, some of you may be aware of that. Basically, that's just the balance between your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And uh, we can measure that. You know, your, your Garmin watches can measure it. Um, there's lots of different tools to measure that. 
But when heart rate variability starts to go down and go down for long periods of time, oftentimes those are signs. Mm -hmm. So whereas, yes, there's not like one just telltale thing. There are clues. There, de there definitely are clues. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry, one other thing. And in, in males in particular, um, well, actually females too, the la 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 uh, loss of sex drive is another yeah. one. Yeah. And, you know, if you have, if you have no sex drive, chances are you're, you're overtraining. Mm -hmm. So I'll throw that other one in there as well. No. And, and you got to prevent it because if you, if you ignore it and you try to, you know, no pain, no gain type of approach, you will reach a period where you truly are overtrained and it will take, uh, it can take months. Well, uh, it, it could be never. Yeah. There, there's high level athletes that, that have literally never recovered. That's right. And, 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 you know, and, and it's something that we think of as age group if we couldn't get to that point. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to say that as an, as an age group athlete, sometimes we have more stress in our life than a professional athlete, mm -hmm. right? Because we still have jobs and families and all these things to deal with. And, you know, we don't just get to train twice a day and rest in between, mm -hmm. right? We train, we train twice a day and, and work and deal with a lot of other stresses in, in life that we oftentimes, I mean, they don't go into training peaks, right? Mm -hmm. those, those stressful meetings, they don't go into training peaks. No, and, and that's why I like talking with some athletes where they figured out what works for them schedule-wise. And, you know, it's so important to figure out how you can incorporate your exercise in your lifestyle so that you are not adding additional stress yeah. to your family, your spouse, your partner, uh, your kids, what have you, and, and you're able to, you know, train effectively still, uh, but not necessarily make, uh, make the, the situation more stressful, even in the household. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, in the off season is a good time to kind of throw those, throw those pieces in. Yeah. So one of the things that I like to do, and I don't know if you do this is, you know, let's say we're, my wife and I are, are going to go out somewhere and do something. I oftentimes will keep a pair of running shoes and some shorts and in the car. Mm -hmm. And when we're like, you know, 10 K from the house, I'm like, okay, just stop here. I'll jump out and I'll run home from there. Uh -huh. Right. Because we've already done our fun thing. We've done our, you know, our bonding time. And it's like, okay, I, I'm just going to run home. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I get there before I even know it. And she's just like kind of settling down and, and then, then I get home and it's like, it almost didn't occur. Yeah. And then we've talked a lot about it before about like commuting to work on your bike. Yep. Yeah. And how, you know, for me, if I commute in on my bike, I used to take an hour mm -hmm. when pre COVID to drive in would take 40 minutes. Yeah. So it's like, I'm taking 20 minutes longer, but I'm getting an hour workout in it's, it's, it's fitting it into my life. And what we've been doing uh, in the last few weeks is taking one day and biking and having coffee somewhere. And, you know, it, it, it changes the flavor of the bike ride and, uh, you know, you can still build in some socialization at that point. And, uh, I think those are all, all important. And you, cause you can't forget about your family. You can't forget about the people that support you. And, uh, and, and honestly, the off season, there's another thing you can do in the off season is rebuild ties, mm -hmm. you know? So maybe you've got some, uh, you know, some friends that are not in triathlon and aren't in, you know, living this life. Well, now you got a little bit more time. Now let's reach out to them. And, and especially in this, in, in, in this era we're living in now, you know, have a Zoom conversation with some friends that you haven't talked to in a while. And, you know, because oftentimes we let those things, especially in the, in the heat of a, of, of a training season, we can let those things, you know, slip away. And I think that those are really, really important. And don't decide to renovate a trailer in off season. No. I, I'm exhausted already. <laughs> you only had it for a week hey i thought you said you had some announcement you made. yeah so oh. um you know you know that i am anti long distance racing oh. i pulled the trigger and signed up for ironman california oh congratulations that's so awesome my second full ironman and uh yeah so if everything goes as, as planned so next october and um so awesome. yeah well, I, uh, I hummed and hawed about it all week, you know, cause I had till November 1st for the priority registration. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, a couple of days ago, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to do it. And uh, so, yeah, that'll, uh, it was actually really interesting though. Cause then I was swimming last night. I was like, all right, I got something I got to, I got I to right. train for. That's right. Well, that's so cool. Now, 45, 49 still. Yep. So that'll be my last year of 45, 49. I'll be 49 next year. Oh, wow. So I was kind of like, you know, thinking I wouldn't sign up because I want to wait till I'm 50 so I can try and qualify for Kona. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, well, you know what? If I qualify, then I'll race at Kona as a 50. Mm -hmm. So then I'll be the youngest of that, of that age group for, for the actual, actual race. Um, and kind of what, what pushed me over the edge is the, you know, the, it's going to be a downriver swim. Oh yeah, that's right. that's right. So that was like, okay, I can, you know, get, get my worst, uh, worst event, uh, you know, out. that's kind of like getting a tailwind on the bike the, in, the entire. Oh, you're going to smash it. You know, you've had so much success at the 70.3s and I think that's going to transition. And anyway, I mean, look at what you did with the Everstein and now you're doing these long bike rides. I mean, you're, your uh, your bike run combo is just phenomenal, well, and so you know the only thing that kind of scares me is it, it seems to me, and I'm like kind of everybody. Once my run volume starts to get too high, that's when I get injured. Yeah, and that's always kind of been like the fear for me um, in doing another Ironman. Honestly, it's it, it's it's been the run. It's mm -hmm. not that I can't do the run. It's all right, but see, this is where some of the anecdotes are starting to become important. You know, you yeah, look at sure. someone like a Tim O'Donnell who goes into Kona and he, I don't think he ran for eight weeks, yeah. but he ran in the water. I almost think of that as being sort of a taper recovery, even though he ran in the water. I mean, he's taken away that damage that that running does. Yeah. And so yeah. You know, last time I did the Ironman was 2014 and I was looking at some of my old stuff and, and I was... 40, 50 miles a week running. Yeah. It was too much. Right. I didn't need to do that much. Mm -hmm. and, you know, because and I'd never done a marathon before. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's the only marathon I've ever ran, by the way. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And uh and I was like, oh, I gotta do a 22 mile run. Like I gotta build up to do a 22. Yeah. Because that's what everything said I had to do a 22. Right. Well, that's stupid. Mm -hmm. right? Because I was doing a 22. Um at a pace that I was never going to run the Ironman at. Yeah. Right. Right. And so I'm smarter, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, so, and uh, so definitely I'm, I'm not going to make those same mistakes. That's, and that's the fun part about doing triathlon, right. Is, mm -hmm. is making, making mistakes and then doing something different the next time and yep. see if it works and if it doesn't, then we, we, we go and we do it again. Well, this would be fun to talk about the planning for that. Cause I, I know you love to plan. Yes. And uh, so I, I think this will be the source of some of our future podcasts for evidence-based triathletes. I think so too. And, and, you know, and then I've got the 70.3 worlds one month before. Oh, nice. Okay. And so it, the, the, that'll have to factor in because I obviously yeah. want to do really well there. Yeah. But I think that's going 70.3 to then a full in about three weeks. I mean, that's, that's a good jump. It's, it's five weeks. Five weeks. Okay. Yeah. That that's good. That's what I figured too. It's, I had a hard time going from doing a full and then three weeks later trying to do a half that didn't work out too well. <laughs> yeah. I think that, I think that the damage you end up doing in, in the, in the full is, is significantly greater. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that's the, that's the announcement. Uh, and, awesome. I, and I am excited to, to share that on the podcast because I too thought, you know, uh, that journey would be a good yeah. kind of talk. Uh, where we could talk things we could talk about um, as the as the time comes. So. Awesome! Hey, this has been fun. Yep, good topic this week. Yep, I really enjoyed it. We'll come up with another fun topic for next week. Yep. All right, stay safe, train hard. Yep, stay safe, train train hard, and uh, start planning out your off season. There you go. All right, Ted. Talk to you later. Hey, okay. thanks. Bye.